Since we are three episodes in, and all the plot we've gotten thus far has been aimless faffing, chasing critters, inconsequential schoolyard drama, repetitive woes with legacy, and a total lack of world building, the viewer may begin to develop a question on the back of their mind. A simple question. When is the story gonna start? Well, I'm glad to inform you that the main conflict of the show will be introduced in this episode. At the very end. Literally in the final minute of the episode. And it's not so much introduced as it is alluded to. But no matter, at least the tale can finally, finally begin. The following episodes will be all tightly focused on the central narrative, right? Right? If you are raising your eyebrow in skepticism, then I've taught you well. Out of the 12 episodes this spoil of a show has been allowed to fester, only episodes 8, 9 and 12 have an actual significance in furthering the main plot. By which I mean developments, events and new information which move the story forward. And that's me being generous. The laughably tiny amount of main plot in this entire show could be fit into a single episode. Most of the runtime even in these plot-centric episodes is wasted on nothing. Even while there's an actual crisis going on, a villain scheming to murder everyone, the authors think that a substantial part of the episode's runtime should be given to mermaid cosplay and shitty VR games. Yes, this ye old fantasy world has VR games. I'm dead fucking serious. There is barely any true conflict to unfold even in these three episodes. The core story of this show could be summed up as villain wants to kill heroes, the heroes defeat them, rinse and repeat once more for good measure. Think about it. The basic opening act of any proper action show already has that exact amount of plot. Aside from that, episodes 4, 5, 6, 7, 10 and 11 have absolutely no bearing on the central conflict. All of them are the same kind of useless running in circles as the first three episodes. At best I might say they are character focused filler episodes but that would be giving them disgustingly too much credit. But every detail will be covered in due time. For now, we still have one final plotline to dissect back in episode 3. Sage's subplot for the day has her witching it up old school at the potions lab. My family is old magic. Like, old old. I grew up watching my mother use her body to pull magic from the earth. I thought, that's how it's done, you know? It drains you. It's like, there's always a cost. But this new magic is so different. It's like a language I don't understand. Old magic tools I know. I can find my way around a broom or a cauldron, a wand. This new magic stuff, there is no cost. They can just do things. Cut their hair, fly around the world, make a castle out of sausages. <laughs> I want to master all the tools we have here. And I hope you enjoyed that explanation, because that is the closest this show ever masters to clarify how the magic in the universe works. As you may have noticed, it doesn't explain anything. Not really. Everything is stated in the vaguest of terms. Sage reminisces her mother pulling magic from the earth. Does she mean channeling some kind of magical energy from deep within the planet? Or does she mean literally pulling vegetables out of the ground for potion brewing? She states that old magic drains you, and there's always a cost. But why would drawing magical energy from the earth drain the magic user? Shouldn't the entire point of drawing magic from the earth be that the energy being used comes from someplace else other than the user? The earth? Not the person themselves? So how does it drain them? This explanation is no explanation at all. Here's an idea. Why not do the same as with Rosemary and give Sage a flashback of her mother practicing old magic? That way you could show specifically how old magic works in action. 
you could have Sage's mother explain the principles, the philosophy, the storied history behind it. She could even have some solid arguments why the new style of magic is the stuff of heretics, turning everyone lazy and careless. She might lament how the new generations of mages are all talentless, pompous and reckless. She could make an appeal to Sage, asking her to always remain true to her roots and treat magics with respect. For with great power comes great responsibility. Anything would be better than this. Heck, even nothing would be better than this. This explanation only adds further contradictions and confusion to an already incomprehensible magic system. According to Sage, new magic users can do anything without a cost. Among other things, they can apparently fly around the world. But Sage herself uses a broom to fly in the very beginning of the show. So how is that any different? How does this drain her? She shows no signs of fatigue or the like. What's the cost here? And we never see anyone outright levitating without the help of brooms or staves. One big distinction seems to be that old magic users have to draw these runes in order to cast spells. And the new magic users utilize their Terrasphere wands to simply toss them around as they please. But what exactly is the cost here, drawing these symbols? The effort to move your fingers? Oh yeah, what a drain that must be for you, moving your goddamn fingers. And if you can cast spells out of nothing simply with these runes, then why do you need cauldrons and potions? The show never makes a distinction about what can be done with runes and what must be done with physical tonics and the like. There's just a bit of everything, simply because the author so wishes. There are pots and potions, because that's what witches use, right? And there's neon colored runes, because that's cool, right? The utility of these concepts is never considered. It's purely visual flair, hollow and derivative, and nothing else. The lack of clear-cut rules in itself is laziness and incompetence from the writers, but what makes it absolutely inexcusable is the fact that Sage's entire existence in the show hinges on the old magic new magic dichotomy. Her story is supposedly all about learning the ins and outs of sorcery and the way all of it relates to her traditional slash old fashioned upbringing. But if the audience doesn't have an adequate grasp of the rules and limitations and possibilities of magic, and subsequently the social implications, then it is impossible to craft personal drama around the culture of magic. There cannot be investment if the audience doesn't have a clue about what's going on. The narrative weight of everything having to do with magic is equal to, okay, if you say so. Bottom line, the magic in the show makes no sense. The different attributes of new and old magic are never consistent. There's a cost, there's no cost, none of these statements matter. Everything just is whatever the writers want at the moment because fuck you, it's magic, look at the pretty colors, also something something conservatism. And once again, as with every other scene we've suffered through thus far, even the most baseline logic is absolutely fucked. See, Sage brews up a potion, but while she does so, she peruses the spell book, as if still in the middle of deciding which spell to perform. Do all of these spells have the same base ingredients? That's mighty convenient. I know when I'm cooking, I always just boil a bunch of random spices, add a bit of cream, some veggies, let it simmer, not knowing what I'm actually making, and after I browse the cookbook for a bit and decide that I wanna make pizza instead, well, I guess we are having veggies to pizza tonight. Anyway, Sage's goal for the day, in her first week of studying at the academy, is a simple fundamental spell. Feline communication? Nappy, when I'm done with this spell, you're going to be able to speak at least five words. You can choose which ones. No swears, okay? 
how to make an animal talk. And what exactly makes Sage think she can do something so specific and complex? Gifting a creature the ability to speak is not a casual thing. We are not talking about teaching someone a few words in a different language, mind you. We are talking about a creature of lower intelligence suddenly being able to comprehend complex ideas and concepts. That's the same as if the creators of High Guardian Shite suddenly gained the ability to write properly. If this kind of spell was even theoretically possible, enough so that it's apparently listed in a common spell book, then every household pet would already be given the ability to understand speech. It would be treated the same way as neutering is in our world. Think how much simpler owning a pet would be if they could understand you even at limited capacity. Okay, that's enough. This is not the Playboy Mansion. Break it up. That's better. Some spheres grant eternal life. Mm, that's a bit much. Excuse me, uh, the, uh, the fuck did you just say? And as always, a huge thanks to each of you for listening till the end. For liking, subbing, commenting, it's all appreciated. And a special thank you goes to my supporters on Patreon. And an extra special thanks to my 10 euro patron Wyland. If you would like to join these fine people, or check out my other creative stuff, all the links are down below. Take care everyone, and I'll see you all in the next one.